Aina, and welcome to Voices of Truth One-on-One -on -one with Hawaii's Future, brought to you by the Kiwani Foundation. I'm Ehu Keikahu Cardwell, and here we are today in Manoa Valley at the University of Hawaii on Oahu. And I'll tell you this right now, we have a fascinating guest on the show, so let's go on over here and meet him. Kalani Akea, aloha. Aloha. Kalani Akea Wilson, did I say your name right? Yes. Great, and Kalani Akea, tell us where we are. We're at Bachman Hall, University of Hawaii at Manoa, where the UH System pres President's office is. Right in this building, right here? Yes, right in Wow, this and why are we standing here? We're standing here because of Oahu that um, the community members, and I coordinated in 2006 um, stands with representatives from the four different islands, uh, four different corners, the four different kinolau of the four major food groups in, in our um, society, Hawaiian wow. society. Can we walk over and see the ahu? Definitely. Wonderful. Kalani Akea, tell us why this ahu is here. Why was this built here? So this ahu is built here um, because the UH CTAR department decided to place a patent on Kalo. That's when all of the farmers decided to say enough is enough and you're not gonna patent our elder brother, Haloa Nakalau Kapalili. So most of these, I was inspired to go to the different islands to meet with different Kalo farmers and wherever I went, they said, um, this rock has been talking to me and there's gonna be someone that's gonna come here to pick it up and that person was me. So every place I went, every Kalo farmer, Kalo farm I went to, there was a rock already waiting for me. So every one of these rocks that we're looking at here that comprise the Ahu yes. were waiting for you, waiting to be picked up. Yes. Wow. Well, some of these rocks were already here because there was another garden mm -hmm. that was here. And when we had the Native Hawaiian Charter School um, gathering to protest against the patenting of Kalo, um, some of the students took some of the rocks home. Mm -hmm. So instead of um, just dismantling the garden that was here, we came back to make it a better garden with an uh, ancient Hawaiian structure called an ahu with four kinolau of the four major deities from the four major islands from four sacred places on each island. That's all planted here. Okay. And Kalani Akea, you were a student at UH at the time? Yes, I was just beginning uh, my master's uh, program in Hawaiian language. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do was just put the studying and the practice into actual implementation. Where in order, some of our stories and cultural practices is we find the ho'okupu, we gather it in Hawaiian protocol, and then we go to a sacred site or place, we offer the ho'okupu, and we wait for ho'ailona signs from keakua and our kia'i, our guardians, our amakua, to show us the path moving forward. Mm, ho'okupu is a gift, like an offering, yes? Offering, yes. Okay, so let's step back a couple of minutes here and talk about the attempt to patent the kalo, the tarot. If that had happened, if that had succeeded, that would have meant what? That every tarot farmer that grew tarot would have had to pay somebody some money? Exactly. Really? The type of kalo that's created, if that strain somehow goes into your strain of kalo and um, morphs and takes some traits of that kalo, then when you in turn sell that kalo, you're going to have to pay a certain amount of the profit to the original or that patented kalo. And that was the um, main uh, instance, the reason why there was a resistance and kue against uh, wow. kalo. I can okay. see why, because to me that sounds very wrong because kalo taro has been the staple food of Kanaka Maoli Hawaiian people for centuries. Yes. Haloa, the first taro you, every, you all are related to. Yes. So it's like, it's like me saying, okay, I'm gonna patent you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. how the Kalo farmers and the Hawaiian community and the Hawaiian charter schools felt at that time. And we needed to take action and do something quick so that they wouldn't patent my brother, my sister, my mother, my auntie, my father. There's a word for that. It's called slavery. Yes. <laughs> okay. 
So you all came and built this Ahu, and what effect, what impact did that have in bringing attention to the attempt to patent the Kahlo, the Taro? Well, right after we um, built the Ahu, within one month, negotiations between the university, Uncle Walter Reddy, myself, mm -hmm. um, the patent on Kahlo got removed within wow. a month wow. after building our Ahu. Very good work, very good work. That was the quickest, fastest, um, <laughs> positive response we ever received. So I, I knew um, going through the process and protocol of practicing our culture, gathering ho'okupu, going to our sacred sites and offering our, our sacred ho'okupu and then waiting for signs works. It still works today. Yeah, you knew you had done the pono thing, the correct thing. Right. And it worked. All right, Kalani Akea, I know Ahu go back. Ahu is a part of uh, Hawaiian culture now, but it's also a part of ancient Hawaiian culture. It goes back time immemorial, yes? Yes. Tell us a little bit about the history of Ahu. So. And, and what they are, what they, what they do, what they serve, what purpose so, they serve. I know for Ku'ula or fishing shrines, it's a designated site where fishermen, prior to them going holo holo, don't say the word fishing, um, will make an offering, pray, um, and also observe, observe the climate, observe the ocean, observe um, the mountains, the winds, the clouds, before you go fishing. So you'll see that certain ahu is really in a vantage point of observation. And this is just in respect to ku'ula, uh, Hawaiian fishing shrines. And then there's um, ku'ahu for hula, there's ku'ahu for lua, the Hawaiian martial arts, and there's ahu like this today that stand here um, trying to bring awareness of our history and culture that got attacked over a hundred years ago and we're just basically trying to survive in today's society. Well, so it sounds to me like uh, ahu uh, in old times were used, a person would come up to it and basically find out if the time is right and circumstances are right to do something fishing, farming, things like that. And also if they were right. In other words, that connection between everything here and everything. them before they take that action that is so culturally significant, even if it's only about growing food to feed their family, yes? Yes, definitely. Always come with an open heart. Mm -hmm. Always come in a humble mindset. Always come willing to learn um, from the environment, from people, um, the community that's there. And when you give an offering before you learn or you um, extract food, you know, a certain uh, humbleness, a certain uh, mindset, um, you get into to respect the place. And that's really the core of this ahu, is for foreigners or colonizers who come to Hawaii, first have to recognize where they are and come in a humble mindset, come in a humble, um, with, with aloha, yeah? And I don't think the university has um, done any, um, well, they need to do better as far as educating uh, foreigners that do come here to know what aloha is and Hawaiian culture. Kalani Akea, we're standing here in what would normally be known as a square. There's four corners to a square, but in the Hawaiian culture, that's way different. There's heavy duty significance to the four corners, yeah? Yes. Please tell us about that, explain that. So you know, in culture, um, the four corners can be interpreted and seen as the four major deities or the four major akua. The gods. Uh, the gods okay. um, in uh, Hawaiian culture, which is ku, lono, kane, kanaloa. Yeah? Ku, the god of government, politics, those two don't work, you're going to war. Lono, god of peace, agriculture, fertility. Kanaloa, god of ocean voyaging and the open ocean. And Kane, god of the fresh water and the sun. So each of these corners are symbolically represent those four akua, those four deities, yes? Yes, because their body forms of the four deities is actually food that we consume and then take on the form and body and spirit of those deities. That's why the banana for Kanaloa, the new coconut for Ku, 
um, uala for lono or the sweet potato, and then um, kalo for kane. And there's actually a word for that in the Hawaiian language, kino lao, yes? Yes, the kino lao. The kino lao, when, when they actually take on the physical representation in the physical world of that god, of that deity. Yes, definitely that brings a deeper meaning to caring for those plants and also preparing those um, items to eat and consume, yeah. And a deeper connection too, yeah? Yes, definitely yeah. when you're eating your uncle or your auntie and preparing it, um, you're much more respectful in, in how you um, do it and consume it. Right, and the fact that your uncle and auntie are actually feeding you and nurturing you and sustaining you and keeping you alive, yeah? The definite, definitely why we have Halo Anakalau Kapali'ili, our older brother yeah. Kalo, and we are the younger yeah. brother, so we need to work hard. Take okay, care. so uh, not just the four corners here, Kalani Akea, are symbolic and important. But these plants, these specific plants that are in here, are in here for a, a specific reason, and they came from a very specific place, yes? Yes, definitely. Tell us about those. So um, each island of four deities, this coconut tree um, in this corner was actually planted by Queen Lili'uokalani in a grove in uh, Kumukahi. This one right here? Yes. So before um, you become a mo'i, um, there's a large area where the sun first hits the archipelago. Well, every mo'i went um, to plant a coconut grove. Every ali'i, every royal. Yes, uh -huh. but every high chief mm -hmm. um, planted a coconut grove. So this uh, coconut tree comes from a keiki of that coconut grove that wow. Queen Iliokalani um, planted. Um, the mai'a, um, banana? The banana uh, is a mai'a hapai from Ka'u, um, which is a very significant and sacred type of um, mai'a. And that's um, on Hawaii Island, yeah? Hawaii Island. All of the plants here is, uh, when we originally planted, is from Hawaii Island. So the kalo that was here earlier um, was the lauloa, and that specific lauloa is the same one that Kamehameha um, had planted. Mm. And the uwala is from um, Ola'a. And that's the Kona. sweet potato. And that's the sweet potato. This specific coconut tree comes from on top of the Heiau um, Halea Pi'ilani in Hana. On Maui. Yeah, on Maui. There's only three coconut trees that's on that Heiau. So every single coconut tree, when we went to gather, performed our protocol, when we seen the shoot coming out of the pico, that was the one that needed to go. Wow. And now they're gigantic. Yep. So each coconut tree, coconut, can be used as a ceremonial apu ava. Mm -hmm. You have the highest degree of the highest level. So these are ceremonial coconut trees to so be used in a ceremonial manner mm -hmm. to communicate and negotiate how we need to move forward. Yeah. This coconut tree is from Kapiko Owakea. Um, from Mauna Wili. It's a sacred spring in Mauna Wili from the island of Oahu. Um, the banana trees are from an uh, ancient uh, banana grove called Kukui Olono. That's also on the windward side. Okay, Lono being one of the four deities. Yes. Yeah. Um, the kalo plants was Kapiko Oakea, that specific brand where the leaf turns into a, to the pico. Mm -hmm. um, Kalani Kalima. Um, was the kahu for this um, area that went to gather all of the plants. Um, Kapali Keahi, he's from Mau Maui, born and raised. He was the kahu in charge of gathering the most sacred plants from Maui. And then as we go to Kauai, um, Shane Cobb Adams was that Kanaka Maui who um, identified the most sacred places to grab the, um, to get the plants from. And so, that's our, the fourth corner, yeah? Yes, so this fourth corner, this coconut tree was gathered from um, Heiau O Pa'oa. So the first migration of the Pa'oa Ohana from Tahiti, mm -hmm. yep. um, approximately around 900 mm -hmm. AD is where this coconut tree comes from, mm -hmm. which is a sacred ceremonial um, uh, coconut tree. And funny thing is when we first planted it, it was the most busted up one. We thought, oh, the thing was going to die. And then when you look at it, 
it actually looks the tallest and the strongest <laughs> out of all of them. And all of these plants was um, uh, Kaviko Winters. He was the kahu at um, Limahuli Gardens. Mm -hmm. So that's the area of one of the oldest um, walls, terraces. So that's where we got the um, Kalo and Uala and the Maia, all from that area. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Heao Opo'oa around um, Haena on Kauai is where we gathered um, this one. Mm -hmm. And we would pray every time we, before we gathered, we would pray, Keo Kua, Maomakua, please show us the way, please show us which plant and where. And then every single time, it was always like an aha, oh, and then, oh, that's the one. And we just knew right off the bat um, that that was the one. Kalani Akea, what is the message of this ahu and, and this, the four corners here and everything that's in here? What's the message for not only Kanaka Maoli, Hawaiians, but for non-Kanaka Maoli, people who work in this building, people who go to this school, people who live on this island, and people who are watching us right now on the other side of the world? What's the message? The message is help protect Hawaiians pass our knowledge generation to generation because as the islands become modern it's becoming more difficult and more difficult more challenging to speak our language and to practice our culture where we need to because of developments like at Wailua Coco Palms because of developments like um, in Kailua Kona in Kahalu'u commercialization commercialization is severing our cultural ties and practice that we are here to continue and perpetuate for the sustainability of not only Hawaiians but all people in Hawaii. We cannot continue to import 90% of our food into the islands. What you're looking at is how the civilization in Hawaii survived on these four basic food groups. On these plants right Coconut, here. Coconut, banana, uala, um, Kalo, you can survive off of those plants alone and they produce the most amount of food in the smallest area but you got to use it in concert with each other and that's what these monocropping commercialized GMO companies don't understand is you need to integrate the different plants to work in concert with each other for sustainability that can produce the most healthy organic foods that we need to survive I don't know why they don't understand this. <laughs> don't ignore our traditional knowledge, traditional practice, and traditional culture. It's here for a reason, mm -hmm. for survival in a healthy, organic way. We walked over to the flagpoles here at uh, UH Manoa. Something very significant happened a while back with respect to the Hawaiian flag that's flying up there, yeah? Yes, definitely. Tell us about that. When students, entered the school seeing that they felt 1893 was occurring all over again. The illegal overthrow. The when, illegal overthrow. When they saw both flags on one flagpole and the American flag was on top of the Hawaiian flag. Suppressing, oppressing mm -hmm. the Hawaiian language in 1895, banning the language, uh, forced Americanization through the Pledge of Allegiance, singing the national anthem of a foreign country in the Hawaiian kingdom was all psychological trauma and damage that students, Hawaiian Kingdom students, were going through as they were um, coming to campus. So we needed to, to fix that um, oppression through symbolism right away. What we did was take down the American flags uh -huh. and just fly the Hawaiian flags and then they put up the American flag again. Um, we do it again and after so many times we thought, oh, what a waste of time this is. <laughs> So um, we decided to um, request from the chancellors and the U8 system president um, to not fly the American flag on La Kuokoa, November 28, Hawaiian Independence Day, 1843, mm. where Great Britain and France recognized the Hawaiian Kingdom as the internationally recognized nation state. So therefore, Hawaiian students deserve, at the very least, to come to an educational institution that doesn't continue to oppress us visually, symbolically, because this is 
the Hawaiian Kingdom flag. Let's talk a little bit about the Hawaiian flag and the history of the Hawaiian flag because, you know, anybody who's online and looks at the history of Hawaii, I guess they see many different flags and they see a whole lot of information about the history of the Hawaiian flag, some of which is accurate and I think some of which is not that accurate, yeah? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, let's talk about the fact that what is the Hawaiian flag? What is the flag that we can say, this is the Hawaiian flag versus all the others? 1845 in May, in the Hawaiian Kingdom Legislature, they confirmed that the current design that we see the flag now as was recognized as the Hawaiian Kingdom national symbol in the legislature. January 1st, 1862, in a newspaper called Nu Pepa Ku Okoa, in that issue, they printed the first color print newspaper which had the flag printed on it. Okay, and it was the same one that's flying here right now, yes? Same, same design. Same design that's flying here right now. Okay, so I've heard people say, and I'm sure you have heard people say, yeah. oh, well, what's the Union Jack doing in the Hawaiian flag. How come that's there? Yes, definitely. So the Union Jack is there because Kamehameha created a treaty partnership with Great Britain, King George, for guns, weapons, ships, before the largest civil war in our country took place, where different islands was being supported by different countries regarding weapons and arms. So there's a Russian fort on Kauai, um, French arms and America on Oahu, French arms for Maui, America, America for Oahu, and look who's controlling the archipelago today. Yeah. It's America on Oahu. So Kamehameha wanted to put an end to all that rivalry and have it be just one, <laughs> one country, his own country. Yes, uniting the Hawaiian people of the entire archipelago under one umbrella, the United Front, called Ko Hawaii Pai Aina. Okay, good. So does the Union Jack in the Hawaiian flag also have anything to do with uh, at George Paulette, Admiral George Paulette, and the short overthrow by Great Britain then? Yeah, de definitely. But um, we can even go before that. So Hawaiians didn't even have these flags. We had Kahili. Right. Those were our symbols. There were no flags in the ancient Hawaiian culture. There were no flags. Um, that we know of how Europe practiced and the rest of the world used flags. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to communicate to the world, we adapted some of what symbolism of the flag is, mm -hmm. and we adapted it to mean um, specifically and identify ourselves with these islands. So in that history of transition and knowing about the flag, the first flag we recognized and was treaty partnership too was Great Britain. And that's really the reason why the Union Jack is there. It's because of the relationship King Kamehameha had with uh, Great Britain uh, and Vancouver um, and Captain Cook. That's, that's the reason why the Union Jack is there, is to remind us of that first encounter between a foreign country and the Hawaiian Kingdom. All right, Kalani Akea, what about the stripes in the Hawaiian flag? Do those symbolize something? Yes, definitely the eight stripes, from what most people think, are just the eight different um, islands. Mm -hmm. But from what I've learned working out in Kona and Kohala area from Kupuna, they shared another story um, with me. That the colors and the stripes of the flag are also embody part of the kinolau of the religion that Kamehameha at the time practiced, mm -hmm. which was recognizing Kuka Ilimoku, his war god, which is symbolized with the color red. That's why it's at the bottom. And then um, the other season is uh, Lono, Lono season. So agriculture, fertility, and then that's um, in white. And then there's one long blue stripe, um, which Kupuna shared with me. That's for Kanaloa, the open ocean. Yeah, the blue aging, ocean. The blue ocean, the wide expanse of the blue ocean. And then the short blue um, is for Kane, fresh water. So when you look at the order of the flag, the order of the colors of the stripes, yeah, 
If the Hawaiian Kingdom flag is flying upright, you'll see the stripe of white. Yeah, on which top. Is on top, mm -hmm. which is a symbol of peace. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see the stripe of red on the bottom, mm -hmm. yeah, for Ku, the war gun. For war. For war. Yeah. So since President Cleveland, December 18, 1893, proclaimed in Congress, the Hawaiian Kingdom is in a state of war. That's when the Hawaiian Kingdom flag should be flown inverted mm -hmm. to symbolize an international symbol of distress, mm -hmm. showing the red stripe at the top of Kuka Ilimoku, the war god. We need to engage in government, politics, mm -hmm. and we've been doing that for 125 years, you know, um, and we just need to move forward. Kalani Akea, what an inspiring message you've given us today. That's where we got to leave it. Mahalo for being on Voices of Truth. Please don't stop. Please keep doing what you're doing because you're making a difference. Mahalo. And mahalo to our viewers. Remember, you can watch us on the web 24-7 on VoicesOfTruthTV.com and you can like Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's Future on Facebook. I'm Ahuke Kahu Cardwell for the Kiwani Foundation along with Kalani Akea Wilson here. And until next time, ahui ho! Mahalo for watching Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. Watch us on the web 24-7 at VoicesOfTruthTV.com. You'll find all our shows, including this one, in case you want to see it again or share it with family and friends. Also, view our weekly video commentaries at FreeHawaiiTV.com. And check out our blog, published daily, at FreeHawaii.info. It's all part of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network.